Amen. Thank you, worship team. How, how fitting as we consider what Christ has done for us that we would go from, from there to think through what is our response to steward what God has given us. Thank you. As his people, as we seek to walk as his children and steward and as faithful laborers for what he has called us to, so I want to um, get you involved with me a little bit this morning, and, um, and the question being is when we talk about spiritual gifts, as we conclude this series on stewardship, which we've entitled Life Matters, as we conclude this series, we talk about spiritual gifts, how does it make you feel? I know some of us go, what does that got to do with life? How does it make me feel? I mean, no, actually, I want you to think about that for a moment. When you think about you as a Christian, if you've been born again, if you know Jesus Christ, that you've been entrusted with this supernatural, uniquely crafted, divine enablement for ministry, for you, the God of the universe who desires to use you for his glory, how does it make you feel? Take a moment, turn to the person next to you and share. How does it make you feel? Take a moment, do it. Go ahead. How does it make you feel? You have these spiritual, divine, supernatural enablements from God of the universe. How does it make you feel? That was way too quick. Take another 10 seconds at least. Maybe it's too early for some of us. I mean, you haven't had your cup of coffee. I don't know. But with that, as I remember where I was when I, as a young Christian, first began to hear about spiritual gifts. And I, I was just like, I, the God of the universe has supernaturally given me some abilities to further his kingdom, to see people brought from darkness to light as part of this miracle called the church that I'm, that I'm infused into as one of his children. It goes beyond the color of my skin, the texture of my hair, or, or language I speak. We're all family, this miracle called the church, and I have been given these unique abilities, uniquely crafted by the God of the universe who knows how whacked up I am sometimes to further his kingdom. I just was, there's two things, sensations that came over. How I felt then was, one was just, I was kind of amazed, like, like this is happening. Like, the God of the universe has come down and he's, he's saved me, but then he's not only that, but then he's entrusted me with these abilities, the unique to who I am, this gift or these gifts to further his kingdom. And then there was an excitement. It was kind of like, for what now? I mean, what does that really mean, God, that I get to be a part of your great plan in this universe to see people reconcile, to see the church move forward in my generation for such a time as this? And frankly, I don't think I've ever gotten over it. And now in the 40-some years of, of having come to know the Savior as a college student is that just the wonder and excitement and that we are now deployed, that we are sent out as God's servants on this great adventure, this great mission that it's going to ring on a hundred, five hundred, a thousand, millenniums from now, we'll remember these times here, this journey of using our gifts and abilities on this planet for such a time as this. And so I get to talk to you about that. I get to, for some, to remind you of how God has uniquely gifted you for others to invite you to join us in this great adventure, this journey that God has called us to as we are deployed as his people in this great mission. And you say, well, okay, well, well why, why is this really relevant for me? Like, why, why is this important? Let me suggest a couple things for you. Is number one, if you fail to grasp this, it comes at a cost. One is if you've come to know Christ and you're not using the gifts that God has given you for his kingdom, you will find the Christian life is blasé. It's just, there's just a complacency that comes with it. And it's kind of like, <gasps> instead of the most exciting adventure on earth, the Christian life becomes kind of a humdrum. 
because you failed to be using the very gifts that God has given you to deploy, see you deployed in your world through this miracle called the bridge for his glory. Another thing that will come, I would submit, is a joylessness. You'll always remember the early days, maybe when you first came to Christ as a young person, maybe a younger person, and there was a joy and excitement, and you were part of this, this wonder of the church and what God was doing and saving you and drawing you you to himself and then using you in other people's lives and there was this joy about it and then over time you you, you kind of get settled in and it becomes a little bit more about me and my world those three people those three most important people me myself and you know those three right and so he's it becomes kind of this joylessness because we we forget we, we think it's about us. We forget it's, it's about him and his kingdom. And this greatest joy on earth is losing ourselves and our love for him and, and the love for his kingdom and his work. So maybe not even a joylessness, but it, it just goes on. Maybe an anxiety because there, there's this anxiousness because you forget of what God is doing and it, it becomes about you trying to make it happen. And there's a growing anxiety about your life that tends to characterize your life instead of knowing the peace and joy of the Lord as you're part of his great story. And I think maybe even, arguably, maybe even most importantly, is, is the church, God's people, the bridge, this miracle on Sherman Way, is it fails to live out and experience all that God designed it for because you as a body part are not, are not participating in your function within this miracle called the Bridge Bible Fellowship. And so we kind of limp along, we, and yet we're intended to accomplish things that God would desire to set apart, that by his grace that many would come to know and love the Savior. And so wherever we are in the journey, whether you're maxing out, which I know a number of you are, that you, you motivate, I know I can speak on behalf of the staff and and I've heard Paul often say, it's just there's a lot of wonderful saints that are serving and faithfully giving to the Lord. And so for you, I just want to encourage you. I hope you're really encouraged through this message this morning. For others of us that are here is that maybe we were kind of negotiated. Okay, Lord, I'm going to only do so much and the rest is me kind of thing. It's, it's still, but it's still kind of me that's calling the shots. And I just want to invite you from that joyless complacency to where the action is to be a part of God's great story and his mission. And then maybe for some of you that are here, you're still trying to piece it together about what is this, this Christian life all about it. And I pray that you would come to know and love the Savior that even this morning might be that day, the day of salvation. And so with that, I'm going to ask you to stand as I read the text, and then I'm going to go back and give you bits and pieces of it and give you three takeaways. And so would you stand with me as in 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, our text... The primary verses are verses 10 and 11, but I'm going to go back to verse 7. As Peter writes these challenged believers, they're struggling, they're in the fight, it's intense persecution, it's growing there in Asia Minor. He writes to them, reminding them in the midst of the suffering of their identity, what God has done for us, their salvation, and he calls them to be those who are using the gifts that God has given them as well. And so here we see it starting in verse 7. He says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And he's going to go on to our text. Just a brief comment before we go right to our text. Is that he's helping them gain perspective. He says, okay, I want you to understand that this is an intense time. The end is near. And then he's going to call them in light of that to love one another and, and to be people of prayer, not surprising them that this call to use our gifts comes right on the heels of that. And so now our text, verse 10, as each one of you have received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold or the multifaceted grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Can you say with me? Amen. Amen. 
Amen. You can have a seat. And so what I want to do in our time remaining here is I want to go back to the text, unpack a couple things with you, and then give you three takeaways. So with that, as we look back at the text, he says, as to each one, you received a special gift. Now, that's important for us to understand. It's not for the other ones. In other words, other people, it's for each one. And he's going to emphasize this as we go, is there's an assumption that for every true believer, you have been given a gift by God, uniquely given to you as a person. It could be a combination. Some would argue that it's a combination of gifts, unique, much like every snowflake is unique. Every believer has a unique combination of gifts to which their personality and their background and maturity engages to that use of that gift or that employment. And so notice what he says in verse 10 again. He says, to each one you received a gift, hang on to it until the Lord comes back. Okay, next phrase. Is that what it says? Okay, let me try it again. As each one has received a special gift, go ahead and tell everybody about it, but don't use it. Okay, no, he says this. As to each one has received a special gift, employ it. He's saying, I want you to use the gifts that God has given you. God inspires Peter to write here during this unique time in the the church as they're experiencing the, the society and government persecution upon them, he's saying, I want you to understand that you are t- who received a gift unique to who you are has been added in the text, a special gift to emphasize that. He says, I want you to be utilizing it. I want you to employ it. I want you to activate it to use the gift that God has given you. I want you to be actively thinking through, like, how can I do this? And he's going to talk about this. He says, and he's going to talk about two separate primary gifts. He says, in serving one another, this is, this is how it's played out, in serving one another as good stewards or managers. We're to be people who've been given this responsibility, and we are to steward that responsibility. We're to be people that understand that as we serve the Lord, it is it, we are entrusted with this gift this unique ability, and I'm going to be faithful to be deployed or employed in serving using those gifts or that gift that God has given me. And notice, it's a good steward. He says that you are to be one, serve one another as good stewards. This is a good thing. God has called us to, and notice he goes on to say, as the manifold or the multifaceted grace of God. Now, it could be that in terms of the grace he's speaking of, that, that not only salvation, but the gifting, but I think more in the context, what he's saying is that the gifts are variety. They're, they're various, and so it's multifaceted. It's manifold. There's a manifold reflection, a differing reflection of God's grace as we serve or employ the gifts that God has given us. The grace of God is manifested in us. He says, whoever speaks, and I believe here now he separates the gifts into two categories, the speaking gifts and the serving gifts. He says, whoever speaks, verse 11, is to do so as one who's speaking the utterances or the words of God. So this responsibility as we step forward and we proclaim God's, whether it's in Bible study context, whether it's in Sunday school or life groups, whether here from the pulpit, is that we recognize that we speak not our own words, but God's words. We speak the utterances to utter the, or the words of God. That, that is an amazing thing to think about, that the God of the universe has entrusted us with his sacred word, that as we, we are called to speak it and proclaim it, the very utterances or the very words of God. So we are to speak, he says, and as he goes on in verse 11, as the one who's speaking the utterances of God, and then the other aspect, the other grouping potentially here is, whoever serves is to do so as one who's serving by the strength which God supplies. I'm so grateful for that because as we serve, as we're called to serve and give ourselves away to others for the glory of God and for his kingdom, is there are times that we will feel tired and we, in and of ourselves, we don't have what it takes. In and of myself, is I don't have what it takes. You know, I, I don't know if I can speak for other pastors, but, but by God's grace, I, I've been a, a teaching pastor for about 30 years, and I don't think there's been a Sunday before I get up, I go, oh, Lord, I am woefully inadequate. If you don't show up, I'm toast. Just before I walk up these steps. I'm just like, Lord, if, if you don't show up, if, your spirit, if the Spirit doesn't animate your word to bring it home to people's lives, Lord, pff, I don't know what's going to happen. 
Because it's got to be with the strength that God provides. It's a supernatural enablement. For those of us who've been walking with the Lord for a little while, do you remember when you first started to understand some of your gifts and, and you really didn't understand what gifting was, but you were serving and you loved Jesus, you had this first love and you wanted to tell people about it and, and, and as you were telling people about it or you're serving, you, you found like, wow, I mean, God kind of used me there. I mean, he used me there. I can't believe it. It was kind of like, whoa, like, look what happened, you know. Or you you know, I remember, you know, Paul and I can speak to, we had this friend named Joe Ventura. And um, Joe was a unique bird. I mean, he was a unique brother. And Joe was the type of guy who, um, to his credit, eventually followed that gifting. But he, when there was somebody that really was dealing with a lot of difficulties on the campus level, we, we, we were ministering on the different campuses, and there was the, we would have people that were on all different places from attempted suicide thoughts and trans, trans dressers. I mean, all these different people. And I remember watching Joe just kind of gravitate to some of these people that were really in, in very difficult places. And he would, he would sit there and he'd open the word. And, and, and then I remember just trying to encourage him, hey, I'm, there's, this, there's this brother, this new guy, he's, he's kind of working through a lot. Would you, would you want to? He goes, I got it. And then I'd hear he would have taken him back to the apartment with a bunch of the guys in the ministry lived, and he'd put some logs in the fire, and he'd open up the word, and he'd spend hours and hours with him. And eventually, he became a professional counselor. Surprise, surprise, right? But see, God in his mercy, just using the gifts that he had, it's an amazing thing to think about, is that the God of the universe works through us to supernaturally, miraculously transform people to see him go from darkness to light, to see them grow into his likeness, to see breakthroughs of grace, that he would use us. Take a moment, turn to the person next to you, and please say this, say, I know, I'm shocked, he'll use us. Take a moment, would you take a moment? I know I'm shocked, but he'll use us. Go ahead and do that, would you please? And so he goes on, and, and notice the end result. Notice the end result here in the passage. Did I lose everybody? Okay, hang back. Okay, so... Notice what he says in the passage, the end result. He says, so that in all things, the gifted person may be glorified. So in all things, the gifted person may experience Maslow's self-actualization, hierarchy of needs. Is that what he's talking about? Can I hear a boo? Okay. Yes, no, that's not what he's talking about. It's so that all things, God is glorified through Christ. The spotlight is on him, right? As we use our gifts and our abilities, as we minister to each other, is that Jesus is, is lifted up and the spotlight goes on him. And as we know, as his servants, it's the strength that he's given us. And so it, it's hard to, like, take credit for things that are just given to us, you know. I don't think many of us walk around going, wow, I got green eyes. <laughs> you want to see my green eyes? I mean, I mean, maybe for you men and with your wives, you know, hey, my green eyes. But I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's about that. I think for, we, we can't boast about what, what's given to us. That's going to be kind of weird, you know, boasting about that kind of a thing. It's the same thing in our gifts. As we know what they're given to us, we can only give credit to the giver, Right? And so he says, so that why? In all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so we know as we use the gifts that God has given us, as we are deployed in his service, Jesus is lifted up so uniquely. And it's such a beautiful thing. I, I, just, I think it's one of the reasons why I kind of pinch myself that I'm freed up as a pastor to pastor God's people. And again, I think I can speak for most of us in, that are employed by the church is that we get front row seats to see this miracle happen as God's working among you. And I think what we're hope by God's grace accomplished today is we're just asking us to kind of excel still more as a church. What might God have ahead for us? And so let me give you three takeaways from the text as we look at it. Three takeaways from the passage and the first takeaway is this, is that you are, <clears throat> you are saved unto service. That you are saved unto service. So when you got saved, when you were born again, when God opened your heart and your life to him, you came to see the wonder of the gospel, you believed in Christ, you need to understand there was a given a gift, and that gift 
was to be deployed or employed in service of his kingdom. You are saved unto service. That's what we see in the text. He says this, looking back at the text, as to each one has received a special gift, employ it, utilize it, make it sure that it's active. You are, um, are saved unto service. It's what God has called us to. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. We see this throughout Scripture. For an example, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 12, He talks about spiritual gifts. There's a lot of confusion going on there. And he says this, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. This is verse 4 through 10. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects or results from it, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one, to who? To who? To who? To who? To each one is given. That means you and I, if you know Jesus Christ, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In other words, we've been given gifts and abilities by God, not for ourselves, but for the body, for God's people, for his mission, unique to who you are. God has said, I'm going to give you a unique manifestation of the Spirit, unique for the unique, it'll be unique in its effect, and its ministry, and its impact. I've been given this to you, and it's not for yourself, it's for others. It's for the common good. It's for others to be blessed. And so with that, we just need to be reminded as we think about the scriptures and the passages is we are saved unto service. If you've just come to Jesus Christ and you've just come to know him, I just want to encourage you is that God has so much more ahead for you as those who have been blood-bought at a great price, who are no longer our own, is that now we're called to serve. We're called to give our lives away. And not only that, but you've been given a unique supernatural enablement for it. That, for me, is mind-boggling, that God would give me this supernatural ability to influence people for his glory. And he's given that to you as well, if you know Jesus Christ this morning. We think about that is that it's a benefit of God's people for God's kingdom purposes, for God's plan. And so with that, as we go on, you see the same thing later in 1 Corinthians verses, chapter 12, verses 27 through 30, where he talks about these different offices that within the body, he talks about is given to the church, appointed to the church, apostles and prophets, teachers. He says, goes on to then talk about other gifts and abilities, and he goes through this list of gifts and abilities. The point is this, is that God is the one, when he saves us, he's given those ministries to us. He's given those unique gifting and unique abilities that we might serve him faithfully. I don't know if how many have ever been embarrassed. It's all right. We're with family. You can, you can nod your head with me. Is it, if you've ever had your foot fall asleep in public setting, have you ever had that happen? Okay, I see some heads nod. Thank you. I'm not the only one. All right, so with that, but sometimes it can be embarrassing, right? You're, you might be in a setting and your foot falls asleep and you get up and, and, and you do the little spaz deal, you know. And so with that, it's when that, it, it, it temporarily, there's, it, it, it's no longer functioning, right? Well, I wonder how much, if the church is truly the body of Christ, how much of those body parts are asleep, How much of those body parts are not functioning fully the way God intended them to be functioning? And and I, I guess I can't help but get excited over this next year to anticipate that all the more as we as a church kind of lock hands, as it were, and step forward and we say, God, here we are. We know you're going to strengthen us. God, we know we're saved into service, but God, here we are. Would you deploy us for your ministry? Would you use us for such a time as this? for this miracle called the Bridge Bible Fellowship. So there's some misconceptions though related to this. I want to comment on a couple of those. Is, is one is that for some of us, we just, if you've come to Christ, you have this misconception that you're just not gifted. You know, you said, you know, when the gifts were given out, I wasn't there. I, I, I missed it. Well, thankfully, the Holy Spirit was, and he has your name on it. And so with that, I just want to encourage you is that you are gifted by God. There's a misconception to think, well, other people are gifted and and I'm not really needed because I really don't have any gifts. Well, that's just a misconception. That's from the evil one. God has given you unique abilities and gifts. He has uniquely wired you for, for his purposes. 
So that's a misconception. Let me give you another misconception, in, and that is this, is I'm, is I'm done. I mean, I've served my time, I've done it, and um, I'm frankly, I'm tired, you know, I'm kind of done. I've, I've, I've went ahead and I've done my, my service. Um, well, if you're on this side of eternity, can we say that? Absolutely not. And I praise God for the saints here. I don't think there's anybody that I know that's saying, I'm done. But there might be. There might be. I don't know all of you. But there's some of us that might be thinking like, hey, I've kind of done my thing. It's now somebody else's turn. And that's never a, ever a time on this side of eternity that we're ever done. Or we can ever say, you know, I- I'm going to tap out. It's somebody else's turn. Because we need you. The church needs you. That's why you're here on this side of eternity. Is God has given unique abilities, and we need you to be part of this great story of God for such a time as this, to use the gifts that God has given you for his glory. Some of you are, are older, and, and with that is you've transitioned into what's referred to as retirement by the world standards. But for the true child of God, is there ever retirement? No, unless they call it transition to glory. I don't, maybe that's the closest we can get to, in a sense, retire from our labor. But no, I, and I've, I've seen this, and I, and I am grateful that, that many of you saints that I know of that are have in a retirement stage of life is that you are faithfully serving the Lord. I just want to encourage you that you encourage me. You do. You encourage me to run the race harder. You, you encourage me to keep pump, pumping my arms in the race versus just starting to drag my feet. I praise God for his faithfulness here among us. Another consideration, just besides those misconceptions, is a consideration, particularly when we understand we're saved to service, is to keep the end in view. Like, what are we doing and why? Is keep the end game in view. Keep it, uh, like, what's the purpose? Why are we doing what we're doing? And my encouragement is to, to never forget is that it's under the great commission what God has called us to as the church, to make disciples that make disciples, right? When Jesus says, all power has been given to me upon heaven and earth, therefore go make disciples of all nations before he ascended to heaven. It's, it's our mandate. It's our marching orders. This is what we're deployed unto. But if we fail to see the end result, if it doesn't get past these walls and it all becomes about ourselves and all the teaching stays internal for our edification, it never is about reaching out to the purposes to which we're called unto, it's kind of like, and, and give me some grace, and please don't be offended for any of you here that are bodybuilders. Okay, if you have a background in bodybuilders, plus you're probably bigger than me, and I don't want you to mess with me afterwards. But, but if you are a bodybuilder, um, it's the difference between a bodybuilder and a professional athlete. Now, you can already kind of know where I'm going with this, is um, I have, bodybuilding for me is not a, sports I would, a sport I would ever get into for, for, for other reasons. But anyway, the, 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 main, the main reasons, it's just to get big, to get big, and you just stare in the mirror. I'm like, come on. I mean, it, it just seems a little bit of like this. I don't know. I mean, it, may, you know, may, maybe I misconceived it. But, but instead, like an athlete, like a professional athlete, like a baseball player, football player, they're building themselves strong for a purpose for being a part of this team that accomplishes a goal. And that's kind of the difference if we never get outside of the church and we use our gifts, but they're all internally motivated for ourselves, but we never get out into the game. It's kind of like you, you, you're, you do all this weightlifting and everything, but you never play. You never get in the game. That's why it's important for us to understand is that one of the main litmus tests for us is are we making disciples that make disciples? You know, are we, make, are we actively being involved in God's great commission? And I, I praise God that that's the call that he has for our lives is to be faithful to that. So let me give you a second takeaway, though. Not only are you saved under service, but, but also you are, to, you are to serve with God's strength. Yes. Okay, you are served with God's strength. So what do I mean by that? Is he says that we are to do it with the strength that he provides in 1 Peter chapter 4. So back to the text, verse 11, he says, he says, whoever speaks is to do so who is speaking. The utterances are the words of God. And then he goes on to say, whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving with the strength that God supplies. I'm so grateful that he adds that because apart from that, we would all be burned out in ministry. We would be exhausted But God has entrusted us with this gifting, but not only that, he's empowered us to serve in that gifting. 
He's empowered us. It's, it's almost like say a, a sailboat where the wind comes in and it pushes that sailboat. As we yield to Christ, as we are filled with the Spirit, our service is empowered for movement, for influence, for impact. And so I need to remind myself as, a, as somewhat of a driven um, kinetic type of person, it's, it, is it, a lot of movement, is that, that I need to be reminded that, you know, I need to make sure that I'm motivated and empowered by the Spirit of God when I serve. That I'm not just stepping out and just trying to make it happen or do it, but to understand that, that what we're involved in is nothing short of miraculous. God has to show up. He has to show up. Even as I had the privilege to go back on the campus and, and try to reach out to 18 and 22, 23, 24, five-year-olds, you know, I'm 62 and I'm bald. I mean, it's like strike one, strike two. I mean, but I, but I have to be reminded that God is way ahead of me. He's way ahead of me, and he's going to empower my service that has influence, that has effect, that has impact, because God is at work. And he's at work in your life as well. If you know Jesus Christ, he will empower your service through this miracle called the Bridge Bible Fellowship. Primarily, that is where we are to use the gifts that God has given us, the church that he's given us, the body of Christ. Not surprising, he goes on in Romans chapter 12, when he, verses 3 through 6, and he says, for through the grace given to me, and he talks about it for everyone among you is to not think more highly of themselves, and he's setting up this whole line of, of gifting that what he's calling him to, as God has allotted to each measure of faith, and then jumping down to verse 6, he says that these gifts differ according to the grace given to us, each of us, to exercise them accordingly. In other words, it's God is the one who's empowering. He's the one who's given it to us. It's his grace that animates it and empowers it. Again, we are part of a supernatural work. It's not just cause and effect. It's not just I put this energy in and this is the, the output, the product. We are part of clinging desperately to God to say, God, here we are. But God, we come expectantly because of your promise. Even the Great Commission is preceded by what? All power has been given to me upon heaven and earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. If not, who has the power to change a closed hard heart to see people go from darkness to light. Who has the ability to encourage the faint-hearted, the weak, those who are troubled, those who are all wrapped up in sexual sin? Who has the power to transform people and to use? I don't, unless God's spirit is working through us as brothers and sisters to see that, to use our gifts, to be deployed in the service of God, the supernatural enablement. And so... As we consider considerations under that second takeaway, is let me encourage you to step out beyond your comfort zone. Step out beyond your comfort zone. I don't think any of us would understand our gifting if we didn't take some steps out of, in faith. Say, okay, God, I, there's a need here. I'm going to step out. You might say, well, how do I start? Maybe you, you're, you're, this is new for you. How do I start? Let me encourage you. Just look for needs and start giving yourself away. Start at maybe at the Welcome Center here and just ask, hey, I'd like to know more about how I could serve. I know there's been a, an opportunity to sign up for different gifts and, or different service opportunities in the body and different ministries. This is a place where we have room for you. You can count on it. Some of you might have been coming from churches where you just felt like you, you just weren't used because you were like, you're like fifth on the, uh, on the bench. You're, you're, you're way down in the lineup. No, no, there, there's no, there's no second string here. It's all first stringers. So you're all a first stringer. Turn to the person next and say, good morning, first stringer. Would you do that? <laughs> so with that, so let's, let's be ones that recognize that we are to step out to meet a need. And so let me caution you. For those of us who have been a part of serving the Lord for a while, a couple of cautions. Number one is what I call dependence drift. That means we may start off when we initially get into ministry, we're like, man, I don't have what it takes. You're just humble. You're clinging to the Lord. You're praying. You're trusting. You're filled with the Spirit. But then over time, you have some measure of fruitfulness, and you can start to see this dependence drift, that you, you, you stop praying. You stop spending time with the Savior. You stop abiding because you think that, that maybe somehow a, when Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing in John 15, verse 5, that it doesn't apply to you. And so somehow, it's somehow you got around that because you got what, I, I don't know, maybe you're trusting it in some abilities or gifts. But I just want to encourage you that just let's be ones that always are depending. And how we reflect that is daily clinging to the Savior through prayer and his word. 
daily spending time with the Savior, barely, daily hooked into the power source of the Savior, clinging to him, saying, God, I want to walk with you. God, I need you today. And then putting ourselves in places beyond our comfort zones that we have to step out. And if God doesn't show up, we're toast. It's a thrilling place to be, though. I'll tell you that as, as we serve the Lord. Even as I go back on the campus and I have an opportunity to meet these football players and things, I, and these athletes, I'm kind of like, <laughs> they're so different than me and my backgrounds. And, and you can only be so cool with an 18-year-old these days. And, um, and so I kind of gave up on that. But it's like, Lord, I'm trusting that you're the one that's calling me here. And, and so, Lord, I, and then when you see the Lord work, you're going like, <laughs> This is awesome. I mean, you're seeing the Lord work in people's lives as they're responding, and you're like, you're leading a Bible study, and all of a sudden there's, there's 20 of them. All of them look different than you for various reasons. And they're listening to the Word of God, and you're sharing it, and they're like this. And you're like, Lord, this is awesome. Does it any better on the side of eternity? I don't know. It'd, it'd be tough. So let me encourage you to be careful of that dependence drift. And then also for burnout where you just find yourself where you're just going through the motions and there's a lack of joy. And, and you're, just, you're just cranking out because you're separated. There's not the dependence that you used to have. So let me invite you to, as you recognize that in yourself, be very careful just to stay abide, to stay hooked into the power source. Last takeaway, number three. The last takeaway is this, is that we remember and we're reminded that we serve for the Savior. That we serve unto his glory, not our own glory, but we serve for the Savior. The end result is the Savior is lifted up. Go back to the text with me, would you please? And notice what he goes on to say in the text. He says, so that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory in the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The end result of our service is the glory of God that he receives the front glory and honor. The spotlight stays on him. And yet, it's so funny, I I chuckle at myself of how meager I can be and how odd and weird pride is. But don't look at me that way because it's for you too. It's absolutely for you as well. But, But you know, when I see God working, let's assume that there's a spotlight from above. The whole rest of the room is dark. The entire rest of the room is dark, and boom, the spotlight is right here. And God is working. This is is God's glory working among us. And and I'm happy to maybe be a part of that in some way, but God is working. The spotlight is in him. What is my tendency? And before you judge me, it's yours too. It's kind of like the weird interview on TV. You got the creeper behind the, the, the reporter. That's kind of how pride, it kind of makes us look foolish, doesn't it? Pride is kind of weird. You know, when we start to take credit and we want our, we, we, we want our eyes, we want our face in the spotlight. And just how silly that is, isn't it? Isn't it so foolish? It, hear what God really desires for us as we are, are to serve under the Savior. The goal, the end result is that he is glorified, that he is lifted up, that the glory goes unto him It's not self-actualization. It's not self-fulfillment. It's not, you know, yes, God allows us to experience a lot of joy and a lot of fulfillment, but it's never about self. We lose ourselves in our love for God and our love for others. That's the greatest joy. And I I need prayer for that because I don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes to be a godly man that always keeps the spotlight where it belongs because I am going to have a tendency to pop my head in there every once in a while. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful because the Spirit reminds us, you silly fellow, <laughs> don't do that. Don't claim that. That was mine, so just repent of it. And then I think I'm fortunate enough to serve around enough brothers and sisters in, in this body that would be gracious enough to remind me. I frankly believe that. But in that, we have the opportunity to keep the spotlight on him, that true humility, it, I think, where it belongs is, is not so much we think low of ourselves. Oh, you dirtbag, you know, you worm. Well, there, I know there's some, some songs from a couple centuries ago that use some of that terminology, but it's not so much that we think low of ourselves, as I, I, I just read this quote, is that we just don't think of ourselves at all. 
I think that's really the, it's just our eyes are on others. Their eyes are toward the Lord and on others in such a way that we don't really think about ourselves. It's, a, it, it's, it's not a matter, of, because we're not preoccupied with ourselves, we're free to love people, we're free to serve people. It also frees you up to use your gifts unhindered because you're not worrying about what other people think. It's like, God, you've even called me to such a time as this, and so, Lord, it's about you, and we're fools for Christ anyway, and so I'll, I'll step out in faith. So recognize and just join with me that, that that's really what God calls us to is this, this humility. And, and what pride will do is it'll rob us of the influence. It'll rob us. So when we seek to take credit or when we always want the acknowledgement. Now, I say always because the reality is we're all going to deal with that at some level. And if you don't, May the Lord have mercy on your deluded, sick, shriveled up soul. Because it's, it's just the reality of it. You're gonna, there's going to be a part of that in you. It's just part of who we are. That's why scripture warns us against it. So let us be people that continually say, Lord, I want to keep the spot on you because it's for your glory. Lord, I serve for the Savior. I don't serve for myself. That's not the end game. I don't need to get the accolades. I don't need the pat on the back. Yes, we should encourage each other. Yes, we should be a blessing and affirm one another as we see God working in each other's lives. But it's always with an understanding, it's all the Lord. It's, it's him. And it's he we celebrate. It's him that we, we, we do. So with that, as we've talked about these takeaways, I want to ask you to do this. Is that, where does the, this message intersect your life? Where does this message, when we talk about as ones who are deployed for service to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, where does it intersect you? For some of you as believers, you know, God's put a spotlight of his spirit and said, okay, I want you to look at this. And for others, I want to encourage you to really step out in faith. And maybe for some who are without the Savior, you're just like, I don't even know where to start here. I, I, the spiritual gifts, I, I just need the gift of the Savior himself. And maybe that it, starts, it starts there for you. But I'm going to ask you to take a moment. I'm going to give you about five minutes. I'm, as it, we're going to wrap it up here. But the last few minutes, I'm going to give it to you. I, I want you to take a th three or four or five minutes to take a moment. Where does this intersect your life? And then if you could need prayer, just say, and I, I appreciate you could pray for this. Would you please pray for this? Now, for some of you who are new or you don't feel comfortable talking, that's fine. Just listen to those around you. So take a moment. Go ahead. Take a few moments for the people near you. Well, amen to that. Um, what a great challenge. Thank you, Tom, uh, Pastor Tom, for giving us that incredible encouragement and challenge. You can clap. <laughs> um, what a great challenge. Uh, how are you serving? Are you doing it at his strength or in your own? At times we all do that, don't we? And who are we serving for? For ourselves? Again, we all struggle with that, don't we? We all have that pride in us at times. And so are we going to serve for us or for him? Talk about that with someone right now, would you? As you head over to the cafe, would you talk about how you're going to serve the Lord this week? <laughs>